We are going to cover endocrine today, and we'll also, part of doing endocrine, we'll be introducing things that will then be um, elaborated on when we do the reproductive system. Um, we'll also be doing more, ho hopefully getting to all of the um, presentations, and also talk a little bit about a review for the, for the, um, not practical, which is going to be on Thursday. All right, so let's go take a look at the warm up. Uh, give me a couple of moments here. All right. All right, so this one, majority of the breakdown of your food. You know, definitely, we've talked about this, the jejunum of the small intestine. That is where you know, even though there is breakdown of some starch in your mouth with the saliva, breakdown of proteins in your stomach with pepsin. Ultimately, once everything is kind of in the small intestine and all the enzymes and stuff are coming in from the pancreas, that's where you really have the lion's share of the breakdown happening, as well as the absorption, bringing the nutrients across the intestinal wall into the capillaries to go into your body. Um, ileum was more about reabsorbing bile salts, recycling them. Duodenum is more kind of just that small, like 10 inch part where you're just mixing up. You've got the stomach emptying into there and you've got the gallbladder emptying bile into there. You've got the pancreas emptying the bicarbonate juice and the enzyme juice into there. But that's more kind of like the mixing zone. The jejunum is the main um name the hormone that stimulates the pancreas to produce enzyme juice as well as the gallbladder to deliver bile that was most people got this cholecystokinin um as opposed to what is the hormone that stimulates the pancreas to secrete bicarbonate juice in response to like low ph secretin Secretin, exactly. Um, then we also talked about another hormone involved in the digestive system was gastrin, which stimulates the parietal cells in the stomach to secrete acid. And again, we're not going into the details, but there are lots of other hormones that are involved in um, control of your digestive processes as well as like satiety like how much how hungry am i am i full am i done or do i need to eat more um you know that's a whole other part of kind of um, digestive system physiology we're not going to get into at all um, are the signals that make you hungry or not hungry it's obviously a huge area of research because people are always trying to come up with things to like help you diet or this or that. Um, so there's a lot of research in trying to understand what makes us want to eat in the first place. And when do we feel like we don't have to eat versus rah, 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 rah. Um, I, and I will just, just as a um, useful tidbit is there is a pretty major time lag in the signals. So, you know, that whole thing, like, you know, you eat and wait a little and see if you're full. If you just like wait until you're full, you've probably overshot the mark and you're like eating more than you really wanted to in the first place. So it's kind of this interesting thing. Sometimes you eat and if you wait for the second portion for like 15 minutes, you'll realize 15 minutes down the road, you don't actually want a second portion anymore because those satiety signals, the uh, signaling the different, um, hormones and stuff that are in your body that let you know that 
you're actually done eating, lag behind you shoveling food into your mouth. Um, la, la, la. Different ways that the body avoids digesting itself. You know, most people, there's that mucus layer. Um, most people got pepsin, starts out as pepsinogen. And remember that that is a specific example of a more general thing that happens. The enzymes from the pancreas also are created as these proenzymes, like you know, trypsin starts as trypsinogen, which activates in the, you know, the high pH of the small intestine. So it's not just about pepsin, it's the enzymes in general from the um, digestive system are created in this inactive form that only activate when they get into the you know, specific environments of the lumens of the stomach or the intestine. Um, when you swallow this 100%, when you swallow, food is transported down your throat via peristalsis. I mean, what was the name for the squishing that was more just mixing stuff up? Segmentation. That was the segmentation, exactly. Um, too much reabsorption of water. So if this, some people got kind of mixed up here. If you think about we reabsorb too much water, that's going to leave your poop really hard and hard to like get rid of. So that's constipation. If we don't absorb enough water, then the feces remains really watery and that's when you have diarrhea. And most everybody got this. So yeah, and if a question like this comes up on your exam four, just make sure you kind of slow down and think about all right, if too little absorption happened, that means there's still a lot of water in my feces, which means it's going to be watery and diarrhea. Um, okay. So, I guess last t tidbits for the digestive system, I realized. One of the things that I usually mention are a couple of words that are just fun to have in your kind of your little um, fancy vocabulary and little bag. One is, oh, it's too big of a font. Hold on. Borborygmy, which you know what it is. You just probably haven't seen the word. Maybe you have. I've never seen it before I started learning this stuff. This is, these are sounds created by your digestive system that are audible at a distance. So this is basically like your stomach growling, like, like you know, you, it has to be audible at a distance, but you, you're, most people are aware that your intestines are just smushing or your stomach they're smushing there's you know all sorts of goo and air and it's so that's just, and it gets single single is borborygmus like if you just heard like a that would probably be a borborygmus but if it's called brah, 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 that would be like borborygmy um what other ones that i think are fun the one we did talk about, deglutition, which is just the fancy word for swallowing. Oh, this one I love, erectation. What is erectation? Uh, is that burping? Uh-huh. Uh, that's erectation. I'm just showing, demonstrating by example. Erectate is just a fancy word to burp. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all sorts of, I'm sure as you go further on, you'll learn all sorts of medical terminology, but I always think it's kind of fun. There's these fancy words for things that we just 
have more common words for. Um, all right. So what we're going to do now is talk about the endocrine system. And we've already talked about hormones, right? We've seen epinephrine when we talked about the sympathetic nervous system. We've just seen secretin and cholecystokinin and gastrin as hormones. So hormone, a hormone is basically a signaling molecule, but that gets usually transported by the blood usually distributed via the bloodstream. Um, and then any cell that has the appropriate receptor can respond to it. Right. I mean, in the case of cholecystokinin and secretin, it's mainly the pancreas and the gallbladder that have the appropriate receptors. So it's not going to have a more global kind of effect. When epinephrine is released, there's all sorts of cells that have the adrenergic receptors. So you have like your heart speeds up and your lung passages dilate and this and that and your pupils dilate. So, you know, what happens when you release... What happens when a hormone is released into your bloodstream is really going to depend on which cells have receptors to that particular hormone. Right? Yeah, and again, this is pretty different than neurotransmitters. A neurotransmitter is just released at a specific synapse, and one neuron is talking to another neuron. Right? There might be, you know, billions of neurons that have serotonin receptors but if you are just releasing serotonin and one synapse it's only that one neuron that's going to respond so with hormones it's much more of this global broadcast that's just getting sent out into the whole body um what else hormones are kind of the more what do you call it Kind of the kind of more extreme, like just send everywhere. Just for completeness, I'll say there's also things called like paracrines. Para meaning near. So instead of like endocrine, like just send out everywhere inside the body. Sometimes you have cells that release signaling molecules that diffuse around and influence kind of more of their local cells, kind of the neighborhood, but not necessarily getting absorbed into the bloodstream and going everywhere. So there's there's lots of different options. Um, you know, the reality when you start looking at the body, all of these nice little um, nice little categories we come up with to organize everything into neat little boxes. It'll it's it's a nice way to understand things at a first approximation, but pretty much always breaks down when you look closer at the reality of things because things always get messy. Um, so hormones, again, we've mentioned hormones like epinephrine already. Um, some hormones are released by specific endocrine glands, right? Epinephrine was released by the adrenal medulla, which its job is to release adrenaline. Um, but other hormones are released just by organs as part of their processing, right? Cholecystokinin and secretin and gastrin are released by the small intestine in the stomach. Um, your heart releases hormones. I didn't talk about it, but like if your blood pressure is too high, if your atria are getting too stretched out by the blood returning, it'll release this a atrial natriate, natriate, ANP, this peptide which acts as a hormone to 
actually bring your blood pressure back down. Your heart releases hormones. Your, you know, so hormones aren't just released by specific endocrine glands. Um, but what we're going to focus on um, for today are the glands whose real main job is releasing hormones that control a variety of things. Um, so hormones. released by, you know, glands, you know, as well as organs, you know, for instance, you know, the small intestine, the heart, etc. So just kind of making sure you don't think hormones are just released by glands. Um, we can talk a little more about, you know, what controls the release of the hormones. So there's like, there's actually three main, thick, we, we already met, we, we've met two of them already. We've met two of the things that controls hormone release. Like what controls the release of epinephrine in the body? Sympathetic nervous system. Exactly, the nervous system. That's something that, so the nervous system can do it. Right, we saw the nervous system can trigger the adrenal medulla to release adrenaline into your body. Um, what controlled the release of secretin and cholecystokinin? Somebody? Was it pH? So it went for, for secretin, it was pH. For cholecystokinin, it was the presence of different um, um, like fats and other nutrients showing up in the small intestine. You know, basically just conditions in the environment in the body, right? So, I mean, I can, maybe I'll just say like environmental milieu is that how you spell it you know, st I mean, just say stimuli right i mean insulin is released when there's sugar going up in your bloodstream we're going to see parathyroid hormones going to be released if calcium is low um, so a lot of times it's just different conditions in the body So the nervous system can do it, as we saw with epinephrine, just different conditions within the body are often the things that control hormone release. And then the one other big one that we're going to see a bunch, both today and in terms of when we're just doing the endocrine system in particular, and we'll also see when we do the reproductive system and look at the control of all the different cycles, is other hormones. And we usually say a hormone that controls the release of yet another hormone, we call a tropic hormone. Right, when we will see this in just a few moments. If you're trying to see what controls the release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland, it's thyroid releasing hormone from the from the pituitary. And what controls the release of thyroid releasing hormone from the pituitary? It's like thyrotropin, not thyroid, I'm, I'm spazzing on you here. 
thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary and thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary is controlled by thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So you've got all of these loops that we're going to be seeing where one hormone controls release of another hormone. And often we end up going back in feedback loops as well, where as levels of hormones go up, it will actually inhibit the release of the stimulating hormone that was causing the release of that other hormone in the first place to regulate and balance the levels of the hormones. So we'll talk about that in, in detail right now. So right now I'm just kind of yapping, but we'll, we'll look at lots of specific examples of these feedback loops where hormone levels are controlled by both hormones being controlled by other hormones and then these feedback things where those controlling hormones are then controlled by levels of hormones. So this will be a common theme. Um, as well as like, you know, that's another kind of question I could put on the exam. It's next, next one week from today is your last exam, final exam. There could be some question like, name a hormone that controls the release of yet another hormone. You know, you should be able to like pull one out because we're going to be talking about a bunch of them today. Um, okay. What else? We should talk very briefly about kind of broad classes of hormones. There's like steroid hormones versus kind of peptide or amino acid based. So it is worth paying attention whether or not a hormone is a steroid hormone or not particularly because steroid hormones are lipids. Steroid hormones are um, manufactured starting from cholesterol, which means that if you have a steroid hormone, that means it needs to be helped to actually move through your bloodstream, right? Lipids don't just dissolve in water. So if you have a steroid hormone like, you know, estrogen or testosterone, it's going to need some kind of a carrier to actually move through the plasma. And when you talk about levels of these steroid hormones, it's not just going to be how much is released, but it's like how much is bound to the carrier, how much is free to actually interact with the target receptors. So when you're thinking about steroid hormones, you always have to think more complicated in terms of how they get moved around through the bloodstream, complexed with these carrier proteins, as well as just thinking about the levels in your body is not just how much has been released, but how much is still bound to the carriers, how much is free. Whereas peptide or amino acid based ones, you know, peptide meaning just a chain of amino acids, right? So like insulin is just like 37 amino acids connected up as a peptide. Um, adrenaline is based from tyrosine, right? You just take a few enzymatic steps and you can get like, you know, so these dissolve in water. These don't need any special carriers. Um, these, because they are dissolved in water, if this is my target cell, the receptors for these are always kind of on the surface of the cell. With steroid hormones, the receptors tend to be inside the cell because if you remember, lipids can actually penetrate through a cell membrane without any help. So if I have some target cell, the steroid hormone can actually just get through here, she get through here. You can have the receptor inside the nucleus.
Um, and I should mention that these receptors in the nucleus, they're weird. Don't think of them like you think about like these G protein mediated um, receptors on the membrane that we've talked about in more detail. So they're like multi-part and they reconfigure and um, so just to let you know, they, they are still receptors, they'll bind estrogen or whatever and have some effect, usually something more, you know, about regulation of turning on genes and things like that. Um, but they're very different beasts. These, these nuclear receptors are a whole other kind of class of molecules and how they function. So that they're not just about like opening channels or something. So, so steroid hormones, fat-based, lipid-based, need carriers also tend to have receptors inside the cell. These amino acid or peptide-based, obviously they'll dissolve in the plasma without any help, travel through the bloodstream, tend to find their receptors just on the surface, on the cell membrane of their target cell. Okie dokie. Um, let's see if I, yeah, I think that's I'm not going to talk about any of that. All right. So what we're going to do now is just kind of go through the main, the main endocrine um, glands, the glands whose main job is secreting hormones and talk about what the main hormones are and what the main functions of those hormones are. You know, so we're going to be talking about, we're going to start with the pituitary. You know, the pituitary, which is kind of like the master gland, it's going to be the most complicated out of all of them. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the pituitary um, and its hormones. Um, you know, then, you know, we've already talked about the pineal. I'm not going to have to talk about that more. Pineal releases melatonin. Sometimes people talk about the thymus gland. We've already kind of talked about the thymus gland is just releasing stuff that helps mature the T lymphocytes for your immune system. We're not going to talk any more about those. Pituitary, though, we're going to talk a bunch about. Then we'll get down to the thyroid gland. Like it's just basically kind of dropping down. There's your trachea. There's your thyroid gland. There's going to be the parathyroid glands, which are basically para means ne near. They're actually cells that are actually sitting as little islands on the thyroid itself. So the thyroid, in fact, people realized that there was another gland there because people did surgery to get rid of the thyroid gland and then realized that they were screwing up all this calcium balance. And it's like, oh, wow, where was something else there we didn't even know was there. So that's how they discovered that the parathyroid gland exists. You know, then we keep going down and we got the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are both the medulla, which you already know, that's the one that makes the adrenaline. But then there's also going to be the adrenal cortex which is where we have aldosterone as well as cortisol and things like that. Pancreas. You know, we've talked about the pancreas making digestive, digestive um, juices, but it also releases hormones like insulin and glucagon. Um, pancreas. Endocrine. Gland, endocrine gland, endocrine means ductless. So it releases stuff that just, there's no, it doesn't deliver it any place. It gets absorbed into the bloodstream, right? Endocrine glands release their stuff and it just gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Insulin goes into the bloodstream and gets distributed. But the pancreas is also an exocrine gland. which means it delivers its stuff through ducts. So when it's delivering digestive juices into the duodenum, 
It's an exocrine gland function. When it's delivering insulin just to be absorbed into the bloodstream, then it's an endocrine gland function, right? The pancreas is always, is like a classic answer on, an, on a physiology exam of like, which gland is both an endocrine and an exocrine gland? It's like, oh, me, me, I'm the pancreas. Um, Right, pure exocrine glands would be like your salivary glands that just make saliva and dump it into your mouth. Or your sweat glands that just make sweat and deposit it on your skin. Pure endocrine gland would be like the adrenal glands that just make hormones but don't make any other stuff that it delivers through little ducts or tubes. Um, so pancreas. Um, and then we are going to spend quite a bit of time on the gonads as well. Again, the ovaries for the woman, the testes for the dude. Um, and both the gonads as well as a number of the um, important hormones from the pituitary are then going to get carried over into our discussions on Thursday about the reproductive system. So that's why I was saying the stuff we're going to talk about today sets the stage for a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about on Thursday as well. Um, and your, your, your gonads obviously are more than just pure endocrine glands. They're also responsible for making your gametes. Ovaries are, you know, doing meiosis to make your ova, your eggs. The testes are going to be making the sperm. You know, but both of these, both ovaries and testes are also endocrine function. Ovaries are going to be making um, the estrogens and progesterone, and the testes are making testosterone. All right. So let's go to the pituitary. And the pituitary story will also bring in the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus we've already talked about is ultimately controlling the pituitary. So let's bring in and and if you've been in um, anatomy, you know that the fancier name for the pituitary gland is the hypothesis. Um, but you know, for our class, we'll just, you just can say pituitary. So here's my hypothalamus. And again, we have talked already about the hypothalamus ultimately controlling the pituitary. So we're gonna see how that works. There's this little stalk, the infundibulum, the pituitary gland itself. There's this anterior and posterior part of the pituitary gland. There are other parts, but let's just let those be the main parts that we're gonna talk about. Anterior, again, in anatomy is gonna be the Adeno hypothesis. Posterior is the neuro hypothesis. Um, again, for our class, you can just think anterior, posterior. There's also like a pars tuberalis and a pars intermedius. There's lots of other pieces as well. Um, the control of the pituitary by the hypothalamus happens in a couple of different ways. Um, for the posterior, you actually have these neurons within the hypothalamus that have their axons reach down. And this posterior part is actually derived from nervous tissue and basically is just delivering hormones that are actually made by cells up in the hypothalamus. So when we get to the posterior where we're going to see um, ADH, which you've, we've talked about, antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, um, it's going to be made by stuff in the hypothalamus. For the anterior, the cells in the anterior make their own hormones. Under the microscope, it looks more like classic gland tissue. It's derived from epithelial tissue. 
but this is controlled still by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases, releases, it creates, so this makes what are called releasing hormones. to control the anterior pituitary. Um, you know, I mentioned that there's going to be more um, portal systems. Remember, we, we had a, the hepatic portal system. We saw the portal system in the kidneys. Another portal system is the hypophysial portal system. There are blood vessels, capillaries in the hypothalamus, that pick up these releasing hormones and actually deliver them down to the anterior to do this more direct control of release by the anterior pituitary. You know, so this is this would be more extra credit, you know, hypophysial portal system. All right, so the hypothalamus can create these releasing hormones that get absorbed into the bloodstream right up here. And then in a short little hop are delivered down to the pituitary itself to control the release of hormones by the anterior pituitary. Um, there are a bunch of different releasing hormones. Um, there's only one that we are going to look at in a lot of detail. Um, I'll give you its name right now just so you have it. Um, oops. So these releasing hormones, there's going to be like thyrotropin releasing hormone to control the, re the release of thyroid stimulating hormone, for instance. But the only one of the releasing hormones you need to know by name is gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH, because that's going to be um, at the core of the sexual cycles that we're going to look at next next class. So hypothalamus releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is gonna control the release of these hormones from the anterior pituitary that we're gonna talk about called gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are gonna be like follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which ultimately are gonna control the gonads, you know, the testes and the ovaries. So just kind of don't forget gonadotropin releasing hormone. That's going to come back. Um, all right. So now what we'll do is let's just look at what are the hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary, and what do they do? And then we'll move on, and then we'll get down to the thyroid gland, and then we'll get down to the parathyroid, and then to the pancreas and the adrenals. Um, okay, maybe we can start with the posterior, since it's a little more straightforward. Posterior pituitary only makes two main hormones, it means ADH, which you all know as antidiuretic hormone. You know, what does ADH do? Raises blood pressure, a um, couple other things like absorbing water in the kidneys. Yeah, so it raises blood pressure. It's kind of, I would say that's secondary. It, it does it through its 
direct actions of causing the kidneys to hold on to water. Remember, it was the thing that inserts the aquaporins into the collecting duct. So you have more water um, reabsorption in the kidneys. We also saw that it was a vasoconstrictor, which also increases blood pressure. We also saw it makes you thirsty. So antidiuretic hormone, you already know well, and now you we have its, you know, kind of place of origin here in the posterior pituitary gland, also known as the neural hypothesis or the pars nervosa or whatever you want to call it. Um, the other hormone that is made here is oxytocin, which is a cool one. So one, two, oxytocin is the other hormone made in the posterior pituitary. Oxytocin has a variety of functions. It's implicated in a lot of kind of social bonding and nurturing behaviors, um, and not just in humans, across many species. In fact, there's, there's a study showing that um, mutual gaze between a person and a dog releases mutual oxytocin in both the human and the dog. When they look into, gaze into each other's eyes, both of them have oxytocin going up, which makes them feel kind of more warm and fuzzy and connected. Um, oxytocin um, is released like, you know, af in, you know, after sex, that kind of fuzzy, warm, connected feeling is partly from oxytocin. Um, oxytocin actually seems to be part of the mechanism um, responsible for MDMA, you know, you know, Molly being useful in therapy. It, having that le higher levels of oxytocin makes people feel more comfortable and safe and able to access um, more difficult emotional material in therapy, even. Um, oxytocin is also um, responsible for uterine contractions when during um, childbirth. So oxytocin causes the uterus to contract. Like when a woman is starting her um, contractions, that's oxytocin going up. And this is like one of the very few positive feedback loops that we see. It's like as the uterine contractions begin, even more oxytocin is released, which makes even stronger uterine contractions which releases even more oxytocin, which makes even stronger uterine contractions, you know, until ultimately, you know, the baby is, manages to get out and delivered. And then obviously that ends the, the cycle there. Um, oxytocin is then also responsible postpartum for milk letdown, making the mammary glands squirt out milk. Um, so, which then also helps kind of bring the uterus back. You know, the uterus has gotten really stretched out, you know, with having the baby expanding in there. And so during nursing, the oxytocin is, is responsible for like the milk ejecting from the mammary glands, but is also then helping the um, uterus kind of recontract and gets kind of smaller again after it's been stretched out. Um, so oxytocin, sometimes people, you know, think of it as like the cuddle hormone as well, because it's, again, part of these bonding and nurturing um, behaviors. So that is the posterior pituitary. Anterior has lots of stuff going on. I'm going to go on to another page because otherwise it's going to get way too messy. So, and again, I will reiterate this idea of control.
All right, so you want to kind of remember that here are hormones, but ultimately their release is controlled by the hypothalamus. So some of these are going to be tropic hormones. So let's start with those. So like I said, tropic hormones are hormones that control the release of yet other hormones. So examples of tropic hormones released by the anterior pituitary. Thyroid stimulating hormone. This is gonna talk to your thyroid gland and tell it to release its thyroid hormone. Um, so we'll come back to this a little later. Um, I don't think I have to talk much more about it. Its name is pretty self-explanatory. But again, talking about these multiple levels of control, the release of thyroid stimulating hormone is actually by another releasing hormone from the anterior from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases like thyrotropin releasing hormone which talks to the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which then talks to your thyroid gland to release thyroid hormone, which will then see talks back to inhibit the release of thyroid stimulating hormone if you've already got enough thyroid hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone, which is gonna be ACTH. adrenocorticotropic hormone. This is what's gonna to talk to the adrenal cortex to release steroid hormones. So remember, adrenal medulla is the part of the adrenal gland that makes epinephrine, adrenaline. That's controlled by the nervous system. But the adrenal cortex makes these, these steroid hormones, including cortisol, which we'll talk about. And the release of that cortisol is coming from the pituitary gland, this ACTH. And again, the control of ACTH is still coming from the hypothalamus. Um, I kind of want to make sure you remember this kind of multiple, you know, hypothalamus is controlling that. This is going to be controlling the adrenal. You know, these are, we're going to talk about cortisol. It's like the stress hormone, um, which, you know, so just your, your mind, your mental state is influencing the control of these tropic hormones, which then are having very real physical effects on your body. You know, when we talk about psychosomatic kind of stuff, there is this very direct effect between your brain and then all of these things which have very um, real effects on levels of white blood cells or healing of different things or that. Um, so more tropic hormones. I'm going to write this in a little bigger font, the gonadotropins. So the gonadotropins are more tropic hormones. These are things that talk to the gonads. And there's two of them. And again, the release of the gonadotropins are going to be controlled by gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So again, that's going to be part of these recur this theme when we're going to be developing more when we look at reproductive system on Thursday. So let's look at FSH and LH.
Um, and actually to do this, we need to make a little bit of a detour into like spoiler alert for the development of the egg in the ovaries. So let's, let me do that right now. So, let's say this is a woman's ovary. You know, obviously one of the important things going on in the ovary is the development and maturation of the egg. Kind of like in the testes, in the guy's testes, he's making sperm. That's a pretty simple process. You just have cells are dividing, making sperm, they get remodeled with little tails and they get, you know, kind of ejected out. Um, so when we look at sperm production, it's going to be pretty simple. The development of the egg is much more complicated and revol involves lots of accessory cells. So there's the ovum, which is the actual gamete, the egg but it's not on its own ever. It's always with lots of extra cells that make a more complicated structure. So this whole big structure here, this we call the follicle. You know, and it goes through different stages of development. We'll talk about that in more detail next, next class, but it starts out as like a primordial follicle, which you're actually born with, like just the egg with a few cells. And then it gets bigger and bigger until it just becomes this big blister that's ovulates and you know, sends the egg out. And even then the cells that are left over are still making other hormones for you. They're making progesterone for you. So this follicle is two things. One is it provides the kind of structure where the ovum develops. And it's also the endocrine structure that's actually making the estrogen and the progesterone that we're going to see during the um, cycles in the, in the woman. So follicle is the structure in the ovary that's both for the development of the egg, which is kind of nestled in there, as well as these cells that also make, you know, these cells here are going to be responsible for the production of estrogen and progesterone later. So it's, it's going to be both hormonal and development of the gamete. Um, and I actually, we need to mention, this is not going to make sense if I don't talk about this now. Um, once ovulation happens, So the egg gets sent out and the cells that are left over, they restructure into another thing, which is going to be making progesterone to help preserve the uterine lining. So this is post ovulation. called the corpus luteum. Let me make this a little smaller.
We're going to talk about this all in much more detail, but you need to kind of know this word corpus luteum because we're going to talk about luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is basically the thing that is going to trigger ovulation and then cause the um, remaining cells to become this corpus luteum for the second half of the cycle. And again, we're going to look at this all in much more detail, so don't get too caught up in the details of this now. But I, I need to have this word corpus luteum in the vocabulary in order to talk about luteinizing hormone in just a moment. So again, in the guy, the testes are really simple. You have some cells making sperm, other cells making testosterone, we're done. In the ovary, it's more complicated. You have this more complicated structure called the follicle with the egg and associated cells, and then the egg gets sent out and the other cells reconfigure to continue making hormones and all that. So, back to gonadotropins. So follicle stimulating hormone. Now that we've kind of made, had this kind of discussion, Follicle stimulating hormone, this is going to stimulate development of the follicle. Obviously, this is female. So this is going to be the beginning of the reproductive cycle. This is when, you know, the cycle starts at the beginning of, you know, the month being of the monthly cycle, basically an egg and the associated cells are starting to develop. Um, in a guy, follicle stimulating hormone is going to just stimulate sperm production. All right, and then the other big one we talked about back is luteinizing hormone. So the reason why I went through that big thing in the ovary with the corpus luteum is luteinizing hormone in the woman triggers ovulation. You know, and development of the corpus luteum. Um, in the male, basically stimulates testosterone production. So, and I, the font, I should have made the fonts the same, but just making sure, I, I want to make sure you realize that follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, these together are the gonadotropins. There are two gonadotropins, FSH and LH. FSH, which stimulates development of the follicle for the, in the woman, LH, which then triggers ovulation. Um, so the egg is released and the remaining cells that were part of the follicle are going to become this corpus luteum, which are going to make progesterone. And again, we're going to look at all that in way more detail on Thursday. In a guy, it's a little more simple. Basically, FSH is going to stimulate the production of sperm in the testes. LH is going to trigger the production release of testosterone in the testes. Um, and again, we'll look at both of these in more detail on Thursday. And then remembering that both of these gonadotropins are ultimately released by, or controlled by gonadotropin releasing hormone released in the hypothalamus. So when we are looking at the male and female cycles in thir on Thursday in more detail, is ultimately going to always start at the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus makes the gonadotropin releasing hormone, 
which then talks to here, which is going to make the gonadotropins, which then talk to the ovaries and the testes, which are going to be doing the sperm and the eggs and the estrogens and testosterone and stuff. So like when we get to the reproductive system, it's going to be this really cool interlocking communication between the hypothalamus, between the pituitary, between your gonads, and then back um, to, with these feedback loops and stuff. Um, so again, like I said, a lot of the stuff we're doing today sets the stage for what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Okay. All right, so anterior pituitary, there are tropic hormones, TSH for thyroid stimulating, ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which stimulates release of steroid hormones by the adrenal cortex, and then these gonadotropins, FSH and LH, which control the gonads, both gamete production as well as sex hormone production. Um, there are a couple of other hormones released by the anterior pituitary that you should know. Um, one is growth hormone. You know, growth hormone is kind of what it sounds like. It stimulates cell division growth. Um, during um, when you're younger, during development, you need adequate amounts of growth hormone to develop properly into the appropriate size. Um, it also kind of maintains muscle mass and things like that. Sometimes it's actually used as a kind of, you know, illegal performance enhancing thing because it can, if you have more than normal, it really bulks out your muscles, but it also does weird things. It makes your flat bones get wider and you start looking weird and stuff. Um, you know, this is a good a time as any to talk about some of the most common kinds of endocrine pathology. You know, in general, endocrine pathologies happen either because there's a hyposecretion, not enough secretion of a particular hormone, or a hypersecretion, too much. You know, hyposecretion would be like diabetes, right? Your insulin is not being produced by your pancreas. You know, that can happen from a autoimmune disease right? Like in, insulin produced by these cells in the pancreas, if those cells are getting attacked by your own immune system, you have diabetes type 1. Um, other kinds of thyroid um, hyposecretion, like Hashimoto's disease, you have an autoimmune thing where you attack your thyroid gland cells. So you can get hyposecretion for a number of reasons, including these autoimmune things where you attack your own cells. Hypersecretion often happens because of like cancer, right? Cancer are cells that are dividing when they shouldn't be. So if you have some endocrine cell, some cell that's responsible for making some hormone starting to develop like crazy and divide when it shouldn't be, you might be making way more of a particular hormone than your body normally would make and things will get weird. Um, growth hormone has, you know, particularly you know, dramatic effects if you are hypo or hyper secretion. If you have too, too little secretion of growth hormone when you are developing, you end up being really small. Um, we have what's called pituitary dwarfism, where people are just never, they end up just super, super short. Um, not just like short, but super, super small. And pituitary dwarfism, it's different than like there's the other, I forget what it's called. There's a dwarfism like the dude from Game of Thrones. Um, well, I forget that guy's name. Where, but where the body proportions are kind of different than normal body proportions. And pituitary dwarfism, body proportions are all kind of normal, but just the person's really small. You know, you can have pituitary gigantism. If you have too much growth hormone, 
people get really big, really tall, so tall that they actually can't even support their own weight with their musculoskeletal system. So it's, it's actually really a bad thing. Um, if you have hypersecretion of growth hormone after like your after your growth plates and your bones have closed, um, then you start getting weird things where you're, um, it's called acromegaly, where your flat bones keep widening and your face starts looking all weird and stuff. So definitely both cases, hypo and hypersecretion are problems in all these different hormones, not just growth hormone, but I've, it's, it's kind of a nice example because there's like really easy to kind of think about somebody not enough growth hormone they end up really small too much growth hormone everything gets over overgrown um another thing made by anterior pituitary is prolactin which is kind of what it sounds like it is going to stimulate the mammary glands to mature and get ready for milk production um, you know, the mammary glands are normally kind of in this kind of, you know, kind of suspended animation state, but, you know, getting, getting ready for nursing, this hormone will kind of get them active. Although again, it's the oxytocin that actually kind of squeezes the little muscles and causes the milk to squirt out. Um, is there anything else I want to say here? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. So the pituitary gland, you know, like I said, it's this master gland because it's got all these tropic hormones, which are controlling your thyroid gland, your adrenal gland, your gonads. And again, it's controlled by the hypothalamus. So here we can see this real connection between how the brain is ultimately pulling the strings on um, a lot of your endocrine system. Um, the pituitary is by far and away the most complicated and involved of all the glands. Even though I said there's all these glands we're going to talk about and we've just covered one so far, the other ones are going to go really fast because they don't have these big complicated stories like the pituitary. So what we're gonna do now is just kind of finish up by looking at the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenals, the pancreas, the gonads, we're gonna focus on on Thursday when we talk about the um, reproductive system. So let us finish up our discussion of the endocrine system now with just kind of the basics of what is the thyroid gland doing? What is the parathyroid gland, par parathyroid glands doing? So, thyroid gland. Thyroid gland, you know, if this is a person Here's their trachea going down to their lungs. Thyroid gland is kind of sitting right inside your neck, sitting like a little bow tie, sitting on your trachea. It makes two main kinds of hormones. Thyroid hormones, sometimes people call it thyroxin. Thyroxin isn't actually even one thing, it's kind of multiple things. There's T3 and T4, which get interconverted. Um, let me just type these, this is gonna be faster to type. Triiodothyronine and tetra. Tetra just means four iodothyronine. You know, you don't need to remember tetraiodothyronine to like write out on your exam, but I th it is worth paying attention to the fact that there's that word iodo in the name. That's kind of why I write it out. Um, this thyroid hormone 
And again, it's actually these multiple things that kind of interconvert between each other. But thyroid hormone needs iodine. So the thyroid gland concentrates iodine like around 200 times compared to other body tissues because it's using the iodine to make the thyroid hormone. You know, it's part of the reason why, like if there's some nuclear reactor accident and radioactive iodine gets spewed out into the air, you know, it can get concentrated in your thyroid gland and kill off your thyroid gland. But it's actually used in a practical way. If you have hyperthyroid, they can go in surgically and remove thyroid tissue, or they can give you radioactive iodine, which has a pretty short half-life. Half it only lit, you know, it's, it's, it's not radioactive anymore after a week or two. Um, so you can give somebody a low level of it and it won't really affect most of their tissue, but it'll concentrate in the thyroid gland and kill off the thyroid cells. So people actually take advantage of the fact that, thy, that iodine concentrates there. Um, you also need iodine in your diet or you're not going to be able to make this thyroid hormone. Um, one of the diseases people get is called goiter, which is kind of a swollen, you get a big swollen um, thyroid gland. That is if you don't have enough iodine in your diet, then you are not making enough thyroid hormone and your pituitary gland is watching, right? Your pituitary gland releases thyroid stimulating hormone to keep the thyroid gl gland production up. So if we kind of go back all the way back to our tropic hormones here, we talked about, oh, pituitary gland releasing thyroid stimulating hormone. If the pituitary gland is seeing, oh, there's not enough thyroid hormone, it's going to up the production of thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, like, come on, step on it, thyroid gland, up your production. So then we go back to the thyroid gland here, and the thyroid gland is going to start increasing its size, more cells, more tissue to make more thyroid hormone. But if there's no iodine, it doesn't matter. It's still not making the thyroid hormone. But the TSH then is still going to keep, you know, stomping on the gas saying we need more thyroid hormone. So the thyroid gland actually starts overgrowing until you can actually just see this big structure swelling underneath in the neck region there because the thyroid gland is getting really big, trying to list, you know, trying to follow instructions and get bigger and make more thyroid hormone, but it's not going to be successful because it needs iodine to make thyroid hormone. So iodine necessary for thyroid hormone. Um, thyroid hormone, what does thyroid hormone do? Most people have some idea of this one. Uh, doesn't it regulate uh, weight? Yeah, so weight and more generally kind of just metabolism. Okay, metabolism. But very, which affects your weight. Like if, in fact, people who are hyperthyroid have too much thyroid hormone tend to be very skinny because they are burning a lot of energy. Um, but they're also jittery and their thoughts are skipping as well. So too much is not a good thing. People who are hypothyroid tend to be more sluggish, tend to be more overweight as well because, you know, their body is not burning up their energy sources and it's, they're not moving much and their energy sources are just kind of getting stored away. Um, so there's kind of a sweet spot in terms of your kind of metabolic rate. Um, so, so this basically control, maybe I should say controls metabolism controls metabolism, metabolic rate, kind of your energy usage. Um, I think I, one of my colleagues knew that he was had problems that were actually ended up being diagnosed as hyperthyroidism because he just would start skipping to the next word on the chalkboard before he was done with the sentence he was done or with working on. It's just, he was just starting to 
everything was just going too fast and skipping in him. And he was also, he was like a total beanpole. Um, the thyroid gland makes one other hormone, which you should know about. Calcitonin seems to be important for helping kind of absorb and store calcium. There's going to be another related hormone from the parathyroid, which has more dramatic things with calcium balance. The calcitonin, I don't know as much about um, the other one, parathyroid hormone, I know more about. But so thyroid gland makes calcitonin, helps absorb and store calcium. So some of the, um, speaking of calcium, when people started doing surgeries, trying to deal with people that were hyperthyroid, that had overactive thyroid gland, um, everything's more jittery. Another, I should say, one of the fascinating symptoms of hyperthyroidism is called exophthalmosis. Um, I don't know if people remember that old actor, like Marty Feldman, who had those weird, like bulging eyes. Exophthalmosis, you, if you have hyperthyroid, you get these weird bulging eyes. I shouldn't say weird. Um, you get these uniquely bulging eyes, um, which is a symptom. I'm not even sure why it happens from hyperthyroidism, but it does. But when people had hyperthyroidism, they would surgically go in and cut out thyroid gland tissue which would help with the hyperthyroidism. But then these people got these horrible calcium imbalances where they were not um, having the right levels of calcium in their bloodstream anymore. And what they realized was like, oh, we actually didn't realize there was this other gland that sits on top of the thyroid gland. So if this is the thyroid gland, There's another thing, there are little, there's usually like four little pockets of cells, you know, in their own little kind of encapsulated thing. They're kind of on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. These things are called the parathyroid glands. And they are super important for calcium balance. These basically, if calcium is low, will cause calcium to be released into the body from storage. So where do you think the receptors are for parathyroid hormone? Where is the calcium storage in your body? Your bones? Totally, your bones. So parathyroid gland talks to your bones, specifically the osteoclasts, which are these bone cells that can dissolve the bone matrix and just release the calcium from the calcium salts back into your body. Right, so you basically are never gonna, if as long as your parathyroid hormone is working, you're never gonna not have enough calcium in your body because you have kind of this infinite supply of calcium. Um, the danger is, particularly like in women and smaller boned women, um, this can go on to a point to where you remove so much calcium from your bones that they start becoming more brittle and fragile and are no longer strong enough to support your weight. Right, like the classic thing of the little old lady who breaks her hip. Typically what's happened is you know, here's her hip bone, this, you know, this is supposed to be her pelvis, you know, and normally you have all this spongy bone and stuff, though, here's all the stuff in her bone, making her, this is supposed to be her femur, 
and for most of her life this bone has had enough structural integrity she can walk around do what she wants and as you get older and more and more like of this bone uh, matrix more of these calcium salts are being withdrawn from the bank so to speak and you get less and less and less of this bone in there to provide the structural integrity at some point she takes a step and and it breaks and again the classic thing is you don't fall and break your hip it's more you take a step and your hip snaps and you fall to the ground um so that's the classic kind of osteoporosis osteo bone porosis kind of more porous you're losing that bone matrix because you keep taking away you're dissolving the bone to keep your keep your calcium up um, and again there's you know and you don't need to know these for this class from anatomy you remember the old osteoclasts these are the cells that break down your bone matrix they're useful for remodeling bone they're useful for releasing calcium into your body if you need more calcium these are the dudes that are going to be um, show, exhibiting the receptors for the parathyroid hormone because their job is to dissolve bone and release calcium into the body. Uh -huh. So that's the parathyroid glands. They are their own, their own separate gland. Even though they are sitting in little pockets on the thyroid gland, they're, they're, they're independent. So definitely, if, if Maybe I should make another color. Thyroid gland, parathyroid gland. These are their own separate things. Um, so thyroid, parathyroid. All right, so we're going to finish up endocrine system by just gonna paying homage to the pancreas and the adrenal gland. Again, we're not going to be going into lots of detail. We're just making sure that you leave the class with a basic idea of what are the main glands and their hormones and the basic functions. Each, it, all of this, you know, there's there's lots more subtlety, but this is good enough for now. So pancreas that we've we've met a number of times. We met when we looked at just your analysis and talked about insulin and diabetes. Um, we met when we were looking at the digestive system. So again, pancreas can be exocrine you know, for digestive function. So that's not what we're going to look at now. What we're going to look at now is the endocrine function, which are separate little um, clusters of cells. The cells that make the digestive juices are the acinar cells, if you remember, if you took anatomy. The ones that are making the um, hormones are other cells that are in these little pockets called the pancreatic islets of Langerhans. And they make insulin. Insulin is released when glucose levels, sugar levels are going up in your bloodstream. And it's basically a message to your cells that there's sugar available. Um, some of the cells take it up just for energy. Other cells take it up to store it. Like in your liver, insulin is telling the liver cells, oh, lots of sugar, time to make glycogen. So we store it away for a rainy day. Um, hold on one second.
don't know if you could hear that on your side. There was some strange cat in the yard and my cats were like, yeah, normally some of them they're friends, some of them they figured out how to work with, but this is, whenever I hear that, I get a little worried. So I wanted to stabilize the situation before there's any like blood. Um, okay. So back to insulin. Insulin is, again, gonna be part of regulating sugar and your bloodstream and telling cells to take it up if it's there. Again, when you don't have the insulin being produced like in diabetes, then your sugar levels raise really high in your bloodstream, way beyond what they should be because your cells aren't taking it up. And your cells aren't getting the sugar they need to get their energy. So that's why you start breaking down fats and other things to get ATP. But normally if insulin's working good, then it's all automatic. Um, the pancreas also makes kind of the sister um, hormone that does the opposite. When the sugar levels are dropping low, making sure we bring them back up using our stored insulin, stored glucose, I should say. So glucagon. This is released, you know, released if, if glucose is low. You know, and this is going to tell the liver cells like, oh, time to like break down some of that glycogen and release it into the body to bring the glucose back up. Right. This is released you know, if the blood glucose is high. You know, so they work, they work kind of in tandem. You know, there are other things that cause the release of glucose into the body to, re, you know, make energy available, right? Your um, thyroxin even, the thyroid hormone will um, result in the release of more glucose so you can run more run more activity metabolic activity when we get to cortisol a stress hormone that's big thing about that is releasing glucose into the body so you have lots of energy to deal with your stress so you know glucagon isn't the only thing that kind of helps raise up glucose levels and make energy available but it's one of them um and again like i said also pancreas is exocrine and also endocrine. This is the endocrine function that I'm talking about now. But, you know, when it's making digestive juices using its acinar cells and delivering them down the pancreatic duct, that's an exocrine gland. And that is the pancreas. So our final gland and our cavalcade of cavalcade of glands is going to be the adrenal gland. So there's the kidney. Kidney. And a lot of these books, yeah, they usually say like perched atop the kidney like a, you know, perky little cap or something, you find the adrenal gland. You know, it's a separate structure. It happens to be there, but it's got its own adrenal arteries. It's, it's not part of the kidney. It just happens to be sitting on top of the kidney. Adrenal, sometimes more modernly, they call it the suprarenal gland, but I'll just call it adrenal gland. There's the adrenal medulla. This makes epinephrine, which we've already talked about. So that's going to be derived from nervous tissue. Um, that's controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And epinephrine is basically just going to be binding adrenergic receptors and doing all the classic sympathetic stuff. So we are already, we've talked about the medulla. The cortex is the part that we haven't talked about. It makes a variety of steroid hormones and 
there are three layers to it. Um, the layers have fancy names, but you know, for our class, you don't need to know the fancy names. There's an outer layer. And this outer layer makes what we call the mineralocorticoids. which from their name, it sounds like things from the cortex that control mineral balance. And honestly, the only mineralocorticoid I really know of, and the most important one, as far as I know, is aldosterone. Which you already know and are familiar with. What does aldosterone do? We've met it twice now. It controls the sodium. It's and what in particular? What does it do even more? So it def it's definitely it's involved with sodium control, and in particular, what what is its real detailed action? Um, it reclaims the sodium in the uh, what is that? Uh, No, you, you got it. So it reclaims the sodium in the collecting duct in the um, renal tubules there. So aldosterone is going to tell the kidney, pull more sodium back into the body. And again, it might just be about sodium balance, you know, kind of what we saw in our kidney lab. Um, it can also be in conjunction with ADH um, to maximize water reabsorption back into the body because you know by pulling more salt back into the body you're going to keep more water in the body as well so aldosterone is involved in both salt balance as well as in you know water balance indirectly by pulling more salt in so that's the outer the outer part aldosterone um, your old friend you've already met in the renin angiotensin mechanism remember that was part of renin angiotensin mechanisms releasing aldosterone to help maximize blood volume ultimately by keeping the salt in the body um, the middle layer the zona fasciculata the middle layer makes again what more generically we call the glucocorticoids but we'll, I'll give you a specific name in a moment. So they name, get the name glucocorticoids because, you know, they help make energy like sugar and stuff more available. But these are, the main one here is cortisol. You should definitely know cortisol. This is kind of the classic, what we call stress hormone. It's released um, usually in response to stressors to try to help the body deal with deal with some situation. Um, part of that is by making energy available so you can deal with whatever's going on. You've got energy. Um, it also tends to suppress long term healing kind of processes. Um, like there's no reason to put a lot of energy into repairing your connective tissue if right in the moment you need to like get away from this tiger and survive. Um, it suppresses immune responses, um, suppresses inflammation actually. So these, these glucocorticoids, so this one, cortisol is also known as hydrocortisone is another name for it, but a lot of those um, other steroids that you get like cortisone or prednisone or all those, those are often given because they help suppress immune responses, particularly inflammation. So if you have really bad poison oak and you've got this horrible inflammatory response, giving somebody synthetic glucocorticoids will keep you from scratching your skin off because it's suppressing that inflammatory response or if your knee is really swollen or something is really swollen um, through inflammation, giving them cortisone can 
keep the inflammation down. You know, in general, you don't want to have that as a sustained or chronic way to treat something because this is suppressing long-term maintenance. Um, this is not kind of supposed to be all the time. This is supposed to be dealing with a stressor and then going back more to your more normal situations. Like if you have long-term um, steroids, you start having your connective tissue start to break down. It's no longer being repaired and maintained. Um, so cortisol, again, makes, makes energy available and also kind of just shifts, shifts a lot of things into a zone that's going to deal with the stressor, but kind of put off more long-term maintenance. Um, that's why like also sustained stress isn't so bad. I mean, isn't, isn't so good for you is, is, it is bad for you. Um, if you're always stressed, you know, that means your immune response is always suppressed, right? Which is maybe good in the moment for dealing with the stressor, but it's not good for a kind of permanent lifestyle because then you're gonna just not be doing as well. Um, there's this guy, Sapolsky, Robert Sapolsky at Stanford. He's an endocrinologist who, he's written a lot of cool stuff. He wrote a book called like, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. You know, how like, if you're a zebra and you're out there and you're walking on the grassland and all of a sudden a lion comes after you, it's like, it makes sense to have all of your stress response on. And, but for the zebra, it's like in the next 15 minutes, either you're dead because he got you or he like, you managed to get away. In which case you shake it off and you kind of just go back to your life and start eating grass. And he's like, you know, humans probably because humans have kind of more loopy cognitive processes, they don't just go back to eating grass after the stressor. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm alive. That was so scary. Oh my God, I just, oh my God, did you see he was just like, barely got my tail. I don't believe, I can't believe I made it. You know, and then not only that, like humans are like, got all the potential things. They're like, what's going to happen? I'm going to, what's my grade in this class? Oh my God, finals next week. And then it's like nursing school. Am I going to even get a nursing school? And there's going to be a job after I get out of nursing school, assuming I get into nursing school. And then it's like, you know, it, everything is just, can be, you know, your brain controlling the right, hypothalamus, which is then controlling the pituitary, which is controlling ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is controlling that. So all of your thoughts are keeping your cortisol levels high, which is going to keep these sustained stress responses going, which in general is not healthy. So it is, it's not just uncomfortable to be stressed all the time. It's actually not like physically healthy. So it's something you wanna kind of kind of think about. Um, it's, it's part of the reason even like when we design these classes, having making sure you know when your exams are going to be, you know, having a predictor over stressors really makes a difference. They've done all sorts of studies, you know, monitoring cortisol under different conditions. Like if you take, you take like a bunch of rats, you know, you have t some rats are in a cage where there's this electric, well, they both have these electric um, things on the floor, but the rats that are, they kind of know when, so they're, they're both here, but this one has like some kind of a timer. It knows like every hour the floor is going to get electrified and it's going to youch, but it's like, eventually it's like, oh, there it is. What's like, there's time for the electric shock. If you have one where it's just random, like it's the same number of shocks over the day, but it never knows when it's gonna come at any moment, it might like, I'm just trying to relax and it got me. Um, cortisol levels are way higher in that situation. So it's not just the stressor, it's also the kind of quality and like unpredictability that makes a difference. So it's like life always has stress, but how you kind of manage to, um, kind of integrate the stress and hold the stress can make a difference too in like how bad it actually hits you in terms of your response to it. So it's, yeah, it's worth 
it's been interesting looking at some of the studies on, and it's also not just physical stress like shocks. Like if you take a, you know, have a, a mouse colony and you put a little cage in there and then you put some mouse from a different colony inside and he's protected from the other mice, but the other mice are like, we hate you. You don't smell right. <clears throat> this little dude, even though he's not gonna be physically harmed, his cortisol levels also just go through the roof. Just, you know, that social stress is can be just as bad and stressful as kind of physical danger. So that's another kind of interesting thing that's come out of some of this research is, you know, it's, yeah, the, there's a real physiological response to just, you know, social, social stress as well. Um, so cortisol, stress hormone, Again, you can really have very measurable differences in white blood cell count that is correlated with your psychic stress. Like when you're feeling more stressed, again, you've got this connection from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the adrenal gland. And then this is going to be suppressing your white blood cell production. And you can see kind of, again, physiological effects that originate from just kind of thinking about stuff. Um, the inner layer makes sex hormones, some sex hormones. You know, obviously the gonads are the main things that are making sex hormones, but the adrenal gland does as well. Um, it can become a real problem if there's some, again, like a tumor or something, you can get a hyper secretion. Um, you know, and levels, yeah, but again, the and before, before puberty, a lot of your sex hormones, you get probably more from here than from your gonads um, when they, when the gonads really start kicking into gear. Um, but Let's just leave that there. It's, it's worth knowing that there are some sex hormones being made in the inner layer. And both male and female have all the different, you know, lots of different sex hormones. You know, it's not women are just estrogen and progesterone and males are just testosterone, but it has to do with how much of the different ones you have. Like testosterone is responsible for libido, sex drive in both men and women. Um, you know, so it's, we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, Okay, so adrenal glands. Remember, important things to remember, take home messages. There's two parts. There's the medulla, the inner, what, heck. The medulla, which is epinephrine, which is a kind of total different gland than the cortex. There's the cortex, which makes steroid hormones makes aldosterone on the outer layer, cortisol on the middle layer, and some sex hormones on the inner layer. Um, then the other glands, you know, the gonads, we'll talk about in our discussion of the reproductive system. The gonads obviously are making the estrogen and um, progesterone in the woman, the testosterone in the guy, as well as the gametes, the eggs and the sperm. Um, and then again, in complicated, complicated feedback loops going all the way back to the hypothalamus releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is gonna talk to the pituitary to release the gonadotropins, LH and FSH, which talk to the gonads and then the gonads talk back. Like these feedback loops, maybe before I leave this for good, you know, feedback control, right? Remember TSH, you know, from the pituitary. This was thyroid stimulating hormone, talks to the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland releases, you know, thyroid hormone. Let's just call it thyroxin. You know, thyroxin will come back and talk to the pituitary and inhibit
inhibit the release of TSH. Because if we have enough thyroxin, then we want to turn off this stimulus signal. So this is going to be like this kind of minus. This is why, so this is like negative feedback here. If we have enough thyroxin, then it's going to talk. Yeah, maybe I should make this clearer with what's a hormone, what's a gland. Pituitary is our gland, so I'll make it like a thing. It releases TSH, which is a hormone, which talks to the pituitary, the thyroid gland, which is a thing. which then releases, you know, thyroid hormone, thyroxin, which is a hormone. But the thyroid hormone comes back with a negative feedback here, which then is going to suppress the release of TSH. So if we have high enough levels of thyroxin, then we turn off this so we don't keep the thyroid gland upping, upping production more and more. But when thyroxin drops, then we release that inhibition, then the thyroid stimulating hormone goes up and the thyroid gland production goes up and we get the thyroid hormone starting to come back up, right? So this is this example of this negative feedback loop that kind of keeps the thyroid hormone in kind of the sweet spot. If thyroid hormone is high enough, we turn off the stimulus signal. If thyroid hormone is dropping, then that releases this inhibition and the thyroid stimulating hormone turns up again and the thyroid hormone starts going up again. Does that make sense? You know, this is also, I mean, if especially living in Marin, how many people have had to take prednisone because they got horrible poison oak? Me, twice. Nobody's, yeah. Um, what, if you were on prednisone, do you just like stop taking it when you're done? No, or you'll feel like you want to die. Yeah, why is that? You have to taper it. It has to do with this kind of feedback loop. Like, like if let's go back, maybe I'll end with that. Um, here's the pituitary. and it's releasing ACTH. This is the adrenocorticotropic stimulating hormone, which is talking to the adrenal cortex. Which is then releasing, you know, cortisol. And there's a similar negative kind of feedback loop here. The cortisol talks to the pituitary saying, stop releasing so much of this, we already have high enough levels here. So what happens if you take prednisone, which is basically a synthetic version of this, so to speak, you have really high levels from the prednisone. So the pituitary is like, oh my God, really high levels of glucocorticoids, turn off the signal here. We got tons. So the adrenal gland here now is not getting any of this like little tickle saying, you know, stay producing stuff. The cells here kind of start atrophying because they are not getting this ACTH anymore at all because this is totally shut down because the levels here are so high. And then finally, you know, the end of your course, if you just take this away, you know, you, you stop taking the drug. And then all of a sudden, the pituitary is like, oh, my God, wait a second. Now there's nothing. There's no more inhibition here. And we need we need to really, like, hit the gas and start ACTH. Um, we really need to wake this up. This can't wake up instantly. Right, since it's really gone into this kind of deep sleep because the ACTH has been really just off, this doesn't wake up and you can get this crash where instead of having just your levels of 
glucocorticoids rise up, you get this kind of crash because it takes a little while for the adrenal glands to wake up. So instead, what you do is you like taper, you know, that tapering of the prednisone is let's lower this a little bit. The pituitary says, oh, this, this is going down. So let's start slowly increasing this. Let's slowly wake this thing up. So by the time you're done tapering, the adrenal cortex is kind of back to normal functioning. But you can get that crash if you, if you just have a um, just total stop of a really high level of exogenous steroid that you've been giving somebody. So that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. That, that, okay. Um, yeah, another. Iatrogenic. Does it, do people know what that word means? I always love this work. I love this word. This is, this is a problem that is, it means doctor caused. Um, you know, sometimes things go wrong and it's not because of some disease process. It's because, you know, most treatments for one thing or another often have side, other side effects that you actually don't want. So sometimes things that are problems are actually caused by the actual treatment. So like what I'm talking about now, like having like that crash would be like, you know, you talk, talk about iatrogenic. It came because of things that were part of the treatment. Um, anyway. <laughs>